let's take a look at the scriptures. I thank my God every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you, because of your standing in the gospel from the first day until now. I am confident of this, that the one who began a work in you will bring it to completion by the day of Christ. Something begun is something continued. Faith is journey and not destination. And if you want a real nice thing for somebody to say about you, I thank my God every time I think of you. Wow. Therefore, my beloved, just as you've always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it's God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and then to work for his good pleasure. The gifts that he gave were that some should be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. That's us until all of us come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be like children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Did you see we forgot some of it? <laughs> by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful schemes. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, who is Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the bodily growth of the body's growth, building itself up in love. The word of God for the people of God. And I's growth, um, for your essential part in that body's growth. Let's have a prayer, please. Holy Spirit, as we shift now from the time of participating to the time of participating in listening and loving reception, we ask that you might be, in the words which are offered, deliver us from a sermon into an exposure of the Word of God. We pray it in Christ. Amen. Come with me to the afternoon in New York City. It's an apartment on the 14th floor. It's on the riverside. The sun is going down. Two women are sitting at a table. It's a birthday party. They have known and loved each other for a very long time. They were lifting their wine glasses and trying to think of something appropriate for the moment, and they both want to pray, but they won't, because that's not in these days. After church is over, some of us will go in different directions to have some lunch, and some of us, because we're only community when we are physically together here and God touches, we'll go to different places for our lunch. And sometimes we go to Piccadilly and there'll be a number of us sitting around the table and we wait for one another to gather and then we have a little prayer and we all reach out and take hands and we have a very simple blessing. Some people are a little embarrassed by that because it may look to someone as if we were doing that for the purpose of appearing religious. What we're actually doing is holding on for dear life to the sense of community and strength that we derive from one another. There is a space between belief and embarrassment that we need to investigate, that we need to allow to speak to us. Here's a small group of people that begin to talk about someone else. They begin to talk about this person in a very negative way, about his life, about his lifestyle. And we who are believers stand and do not speak and we need to be careful because faith always calls for a word. And when the word is spoken, it calls for a word made alive in your living. We know that, but these are difficult times. These are difficult times for us to have faith in God in a very rational way. We say, I want to believe in God, but sometimes it's not easy. I believe that there is a God, but sometimes things happen and don't make sense. Somebody gave me a book for my birthday last week entitled, I'd really like to be an atheist, but I don't have quite enough faith. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? But let me say to you that there is an enormous distance between faith as blessed assurance and faith as scientific certainty. We are not, listen, we are not having war with science. 
That war was concluded years ago. We are not afraid of any truth that comes from any department of human experience. Whether it's science or philosophy or whatever, faith is not fragile. Faith does not break apart upon investigation. But what you and I represent is a reality that says faith as reason is not enough because reason falls apart every now and then. For example, is there anyone out there that knows something good to do and doesn't do it? So much for reason, right? And the bottom line is that the heart has reasons that reason has never been able to understand. And when you and I stand and say, I believe in God, that is faith at work, and the rest follows. You don't have to be embarrassed about it. Or what about this, faith in a good God in a world like this? Our faith in a God of love in times like these. That's not easy. I had at least two people say to me last week, how in the world can you have faith in a God of love? And look at what happened over there across the ocean with all of those people. We don't even know how many people died. Oh, here come the mudslides and that poor man losing his whole family. The devil with the house, that's bad enough. But the loss of life? And we don't understand it. And what we'll often do is we'll say, you see, there's no God of love. There's no God that's good. There's no God that's decent. But somehow or the other, I don't know how it works, but I've got to tell you that somehow or the other, other out of all this stuff that is bad, God is going to continue to draw some things that are very good. It's already begun. We will be present in that through our love offerings here, but we'll be present in that way in a lot of other areas of life, a lot closer than where the tsunami struck. Good is a very hard thing. I've never been able to figure that one out, have you? Why is it that evil seems so easy? Maybe that's my confession. And good seems so hard. But I want to tell you, evil is real. Listen. Social, personal, political, National, international evil is real. Good is hard. you got to work it. And you'll never be able to close the gap except with God. God's necessary. But the God of love is the God that has created the world in the best possible way. And although we can't figure everything out exactly in the moment, in time and in eternity, we'll see clearly what we don't see clearly now. How lovely that the young man that we have loved and helped to get treatment can say to us, I see clearly now. How lovely for me to be able to announce to you today that Ray Lenore, our much beloved former security guard, is sitting in this congregation right back there having one day off. God bless him. I think it's very important for us to hold on to the fact that it's not an easy thing to be a Christian in our kind of day, in our kind of times, to believe that God is always a good, or that God is always working through circumstances to make sure that things come out exactly the way it says. He who has begun a good work in you is going to continue that good work in you. So don't be embarrassed if you have to talk to somebody about heaven. It's nice to talk about heaven. We all want to go to heaven. Uh, what do you think about heaven? Don't have to tell me all right now. Let me tell you what Jesus said. Where I am, there you'll be. That's good. That's probably good enough. That's probably that's all that's necessary. How many times have you heard anybody preach lately about hell? It's a hell of a topic, I'll tell you. Nobody wants to deal with it. I'm not trying to be cute. You know what Jesus says about that? Let me tell you a couple of things Jesus said about that. It's a lot scarier than some of the things we preacher types try to work up. He says, outer darkness. He says, no relationships. You can't get from one place to the other to try to express love and care. But you know what heaven and hell is about? Don't let that go too quickly. Don't be embarrassed about that too often. I don't think we need to mention it all the time because our desire is for redemption and not for condemnation. But I think that what you need to recognize is that heaven and hell are symbols for the difference between good and evil. That there's some things that are good that endure and there's some things and some choices that we keep on making that aren't so hot and they pass. And sometimes they keep on keeping on and we pass. And we have never found our way out of or into what God has in mind for us. And I'm going to tell you this. Listen to me carefully. God never, ever sends anyone to hell. Never has, never did, and never will. That's something we do for ourselves. You can kind of construct the reality 
of that hell in any way you want. I don't want to preach about it. But I want to tell you that you can't run away from or be embarrassed about the fact that good is one thing and evil is another. And we want to try to seek and find and live and do good. It's translating the whole thing. It's not so far away from the announcements. It's not so far away of you're getting up and getting out and coming to church. A lot of people would say, what in the world am I doing getting up and going to church? You know, I'm not into that. I'll tell you what you did. You got up and you came and you made yourself available because you know that there's a space in you that can't get filled. And you keep on trying to fill it with a thousand different devices and it still stays empty. And you come to church and all of a sudden you say, it's, it's kind of getting filled. Um, it's being addressed. It's acknowledged. Something's happening. See? He who began a good work in you continues a good work. Will, I want to start doing, willing some stuff that's good for me. I want to start willing doing some stuff that's good for God's others. Incidentally, that's all of God's others, not just the people we like. Hear me, I want to start doing some stuff, will some stuff, do some stuff that is good for me. I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about you, me. Me too. Are you with me? Because if you can't stand yourself, it sure is hard to love people. And if you can't stand people, it's hard to love the God that made them. It's a, it's a package, always has been. Will Willeman is coming next week to do the pastor school, and uh, Todd and I are going to be there. We need it. <laughs> no, I need it. I can't speak for Todd, but I think Todd, Todd needs it. And Will Willeman was the dean of the chapel at Duke for a long time, and then he had a terrible experience. He got elected a bishop. But anyway, he's going to be coming. <laughs> Excuse me, Mr. District Superintendent, but... Uh, Incidentally, our bishop's coming to preach for us uh, first Sunday in, in February. So she's going to preach for all the services. She said, can I preach at all the services? And I said, sure. And she said, what else can I do? I said, you can teach Sunday school. She said, what else can I do? I said, you can go eat at Piccadilly. And um, so a couple of weeks being here. But anyway, Will, Will Willeman, in one of his sermons, has a very interesting word. And we're very close to the conclusion here, so stay with me. Um, he has a student in his class. He's very bright. He's in systematic theology. Um, he's a clergy person. He's going to be a full-time preacher. He's got a lot of ideas. But his roommate is a Muslim boy uh, whose name is Muhammad Kali. Um, I think it's Kalib with a B. But anyway, um, so the boy comes to class one day, and he says, can I say something to you? He's talking to the teacher after the class is over. And he said, I had this strange experience with my roommate. And uh, so Will said, what? And he said, well, he asked me if I believed in God. And I told him, certainly. And the young Muslim boy said, well, that's interesting because I never heard you talk about it. He said, do you believe in prayer? And the fellow said, certainly. Well, that's interesting because I never saw you pray. Do you believe in deeds of hospitality and loving kindness? Well, of course I do. All Christians do. Interesting, said the Muslim boy. <laughs> I never saw you do any. He said, you ever see me do any? And the boy said, I see you pray five times a day. And I can't get you to talk about anything else but God. And I have seen hospitality and loving kindness on your part. And the young Muslim boy said, would it be good for me to say, go thou and do likewise. We don't want to be instructed by anybody else. We don't want to be told that we don't measure up. But let me tell you something. Did you catch it? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. We're not responsible for their salvation. We're responsible for our faithfulness. We're responsible for living the gospel as best we know how, without embarrassment and without apology. Note, as we conclude, it is not necessary for you to make a show of your religion but there ought to be at least enough evidence for a verdict. <laughs> at least some. God, the living God, can make of us the men and women of faith that can live our faith without embarrassment, believing without apology. May God make it so. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. And now, so. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the time that we have had and for the time that we shall have. 
Since Beth had to leave early, God, Todd's going to be taking the sacrament to the back. Some of us might want to stop and take that outward sign of your presence into our inward person. It's kind of a faith renewal. Maybe for some of us, the first time we ever took you in. Help us to do just that according to our needs in Christ. Amen.